Sorry, you can hear me. Can you hear me down the back? Cool. Can you still hear me? Excellent. Okay. Um, how you doing? My name is Fergal Byrne. Um, and I'm going to... Unfortunately, I don't have the demo that I was planning because the guy who's developing the software uh, is developing it so much that it doesn't, it doesn't actually build today, apparently. <laughs> so, um, but I assure you, I'll give details of where to get his software. It's very impressive. I have some videos of the demos that he gave uh, about a month ago in New York, um, and they're very impressive. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about his software um, when I was supposed to be talking about the demo. And if you like, I can just give you a, some, uh, a look at those clips. So, um, but I'm really mainly interested in the, uh, the theory of how our brains work and what we can do to build software that uh, operates on those principles. And we've made some significant progress in the last couple of years on this subject. So I'm just going to let you know about that. And um, then I'll talk about the kind of software side of things and the technology side of things as well. OK, so a little bit of a crash course in neuroscience. Um, you don't need to take notes on this. but. Uh, so this is the subject of interest, which is the human brain. Now, we, we actually model everything, every, the mammalian brain. The most important thing is the surface of the, of the brain here, which is called the neocortex, which means the new crust or bark. And that's actually where you guys are, right? Everything else is effectively shared with a lizard or birds or anything else you like. But the stuff on the outside... Uh, only mammals have that, and we have the most complex and biggest of those. So that's uh, really a, a map based on fMRI of the signals being sent from one area to another inside the brain. Um, and you can see that there's an awful lot of wiring going on. And in fact, that's most of the volume of your brain is actually the cables that are going from one place to another carrying the information. Um, so I'll just stop that and... Okay, so at a microscopic level then, um, this guy, he's one of the leading neuroscientists. So this is a bunch of neurons that are arranged in a kind of a columnar structure. And what they've done is they've taken a scanning electron microscope and they've identified using crowdsourcing uh, individual pieces of individual neurons. And this thing here is like two microns long and about one micron in diameter. And it's connected to one particular, uh, the red neuron here in the center. And what he's showing here is each of those colors basically is a different neuron. So there's 675 synapses, which are junctions, 530 axons, which are 530 cables coming from other neurons just in that tiny space. Uh, and 90 dendrites belonging to other neurons, okay? So you can see how closely packed this stuff is. And uh, basically that goes on for another couple of minutes, but it's very, very impressive just to show you the kind of complexity of the kind of stuff you're talking about. So this is at an even more uh, closer level, but this is like a flyby of the, the stuff that they found just in this tiny little piece of... Uh, around a neuron. So this is about one hundred trillionth or something of your brain, right? Okay, so this complexity here, you can basically go in every direction, you know, uh, you know uh, 10,000 kilometers that way and 10,000 kilometers that way, and you'll get approximately how big your brain is. Okay, so that's what kind of what we're up against here. So, um, there are some people like Henry Markram, who's running the Human Brain Project. And what he wants to do is to go from the genes that create this structure, and then they tell you how to build it and how to connect everything together. And then he wants to simulate all of this stuff in a supercomputer and simulate an entire brain and then get intelligence from that. Right? Okay. But he got a billion euros for that 
totally ridiculous idea, so that's fine. And it's actually informing a lot of these and funding a lot of these projects. Um, but that's, that's literally what he's doing. So we decided to do something a bit more feasible. Um, and that's another thing. That's actually from Mark Rimm's thing, I think, as well. So this is a much smaller, uh, this is a single neuron. And then it, I might be able to speed it up. It uh, spreads out to a number of different neurons. Um, and really, this is the kind of circuit we're trying to uh, reproduce. So this is approximately 10,000 neurons. And you can see that there, there's this columnar vertical structure um, that they seem to be organized uh, pointing up and down. And you can see here that out of all these 10,000 neurons, at any given moment, there's only a very small number of them firing. That's a really key thing that is uh, central to the software that we build. Um, because each different kind of flashing pattern uh, represents something semantic. And that's the kind of thing that we're reproducing in our, in our work. So bear with me one second. OK, so this is a approximately 100-year-old uh, drawing made by, a, made by a Spaniard who's one of the pioneers of neuroscience. And there are three different views of the layered structure that you see in, in neocortex. Um, and you can see there at the top that there are very few uh, cell bodies, and there's only connections. And then with each layer, then you get different characteristics of connections, horizontal connections, and cell bodies, and so on. And basically what we're trying to do is to try and figure out what's going on in each of those layers, how they communicate with each other, and what the information processing is. So that's really what uh, HTM is all about. Um, oh, sorry, just one, one moment. The other thing you can see is that over here, you can see that there's a columnar structure. So there are connections that go up and down between the various different layers, and that's very important as well. OK. Right, so this is what a real neuron looks like. And that's the cell body at the center. Uh, the, this is what's called a pyramidal cell, because the cell body is like a pyramid shape. And if you look at a detail of any of these bits here, which are called dendrites, because they look like tree branches, you see these little uh, spikes, which we saw in the video earlier, which are uh, form connections with other neurons. So they actually receive information from other neurons. They integrate it locally, and then they send it into the cell body, and the cell body decides whether or not to fire. OK. So that's the end of the neuroscience. We'd be glad to hear. Um, and what I'm going to show you now is just a couple of the models that we use, which are, as you'll see, dramatically more complex compared with artificial neural networks. So this is a single neuron in uh, HTM. And this is the cell body, which uh, is kind of the dumbest part of the whole thing, because it just uh, basically figures out what, what inputs it gets. And then, so it's like a, an artificial neural network neuron. But the important thing is these inputs that are much more complicated. So these guys down here are what are called proximal or nearby dendrites. And what they do is they handle the feed-forward input. Okay, so in a traditional neural net, you send an input into the bottom layer, and it would go in through something like this into the cell body, and then you get to fire. Okay, so uh, the stuff that we do is somewhat similar to that, but not exactly. It's a tiny bit more complicated, but it's, it's roughly equivalent to that. But the most important things are these guys up here, which are called distal dendrites or far away dendrites. And what they do is they take context information, either from uh, feedback from higher regions or local nearby neurons that are in the same layer. Okay? And so the equivalent idea in, uh, in neural nets would be recurrent neural nets or recursive neural nets. But in, in fact, this is quite different and performs a different computation. Um, and these guys dramatically outnumber the connections that you have down here. So you would typically have a, maybe up to a few hundred 
connections at this level, but you would have up to 10,000 connections up here. Right? So uh, our, our typical region that we would use would have somewhere in the region of two to 300 million lateral connections of this type. And it would only have, you know, of the order of a couple of hundred or a couple of thousand inputs to the whole region. Okay, so that's, that's a neuron. And, and these guys here are active coincidence detectors. So they're split up into segments. And basically, the segment will only fire if enough of these guys fire at the same time. So what they're doing is, each one of them is effectively looking for a pattern, either in context that has just happened, coming from nearby, or a, something from above that says, you know, you're looking at this, expect that. Okay, so what, what happens is these things integrate information about the past and about expectations, and they will contribute to the firing of this neuron if the prediction that they generate agrees with the uh, inputs that you have down here. Okay, and the red thing is the output. Okay, so as if you didn't need enough complication, uh, these uh, cells are arranged in columns which I was telling you about. And they basically, they all share similar inputs, but they each have different distal inputs. So I'm just after shrinking this diagram down, but these were the guys who were above the, the pyramid before, and these are the same uh, proximal feed-forward inputs as before. And in addition to that, you have a kind of a super cell which is wrapped around all of these guys. And it has a kind of a stronger response to the feed forward, but it doesn't have any predictive response, uh, predictive input. And it's a, it's a column inhi inhibitory cell, and it serves a particular function, which I'll explain in a second. Okay, so basically what happens is, is that uh, in, from the previous time step and from feedback, each of these cells here has a different level of uh, depolarization caused by these inputs here. So that each one of them is at a different starting voltage when it gets the feed forward. And that tells you basically what each one of them, how much each one of them is predicting that it'll become active. And then when the feed forward comes in, uh, there's essentially a race between all of these cells and the larger white dotted line cell about which one fires first. So depending on how strong the inputs are from prediction and how strong the inputs are from feed forward, uh, essentially either one of these guys or more of these guys beat the, uh, the supercell, or the supercell wins out because it has a stronger feed-forward response. And in the case that the, an individual cell or a small number of cells fire first, then we call that a predicted input. In other words, the prediction was so strong that it was able to uh, supersede the fact that this guy had a, had a strong feed-forward response. Um, and if you don't have that and the, and the the, cell fire, the supercell fires, then several of these cells will fire at the same time because it, the, the column is confused about which prediction corresponds to the input. Okay, and then in that case, you get a different, you get a different output. Okay, so um, that's an explanation of how these things work, and I'm just going to explain it in a slightly different way, um, which is just in a mathematical vector form. So if people are familiar with how neural networks are often modeled in uh, using vector algebra, then this is, this is a formulation I've done that really kind of explains in a very similar sort of language. Um, so you get a, an input vector xt, and each neuron has its own uh, connection vector on its dendrite, and that basically says how many, how many of these uh, synapses are connected. Okay, so that's, that's a separate rule which I, which I can talk about separately. And you just calculate this overlap, which is basically how strongly the connection vector, which characterizes the neuron, and matches the input. And you just calculate that as a dot product. So you can think of the vector as pointing in a particular direction in high dimensional space. And then the input comes in, and you're measuring how close those vectors are in, in, in terms of their directions. Um, and then for the... Uh, for the transition memory, which is the prediction stuff, um, you have a previous Y, which is the representation in the layer. And you do a similar thing for each dendrite segment. And you see if it exceeds a threshold. 
and then you basically add up those thresholds and you get this predictive overlap. And then the speed of firing of the neuron or the, the rate at which the voltage rises is a linear combination of those two. So, and then, so it's one over that to give you the time to fire. And then this t tau i is then the one for the, for the inhibitory uh, cell. Okay, and then the formation of the sparse distributed representation, which is the output of the layer, is a sequence which basically starts off with the cells that were highly predictive, and then the inhibitory cells, and then the ones that, sorry, the ones that uh, were predicted belonging to those ones, and then the feed-forward responding inhibitory cells, and then these bursting cells which, uh, where the, the thing is confused. And that's effectively, the first thing is basically saying, the P pred is basically saying, this is what I predicted and got. Okay, so it's a vector that says, this is a representation of the things that I was expecting to see next that I actually got to see. And then the P burst is things that I wasn't predicting so well, but that's what the reality said. So it's the first one basically points in the direction of what you're expecting to see and and was confirmed by observation. And the second one then is a prediction error vector. And the two of them together represent the input, but they, it's separated out effectively in time, which is, which is quite important. Okay, so that's essentially what, how HTM works, right? Now, this is the reason why you haven't seen, if you go looking for HTM and how it works, why you haven't seen it like this, is because it's actually much more complicated than this, right? Okay, this is like a summary barely digestible version of it, okay. Um, but what I've been trying to do over the last year is trying to get beyond a single layer and the other people working in HTM have been doing that as well. So uh, this is what I've come up with, right? So this is, again, these layers. Layer one is the one that doesn't have any cell bodies. Layer two and layer three are often considered as one layer. Layer four is where the, most of the inputs come into. And it does a particular type of processing, which I'll talk about in a sec. Layer five does motor output. And layer six basically decides what all the other layers are doing. It controls the inputs. It controls what, what the activity levels of different things. So the operating system is down here. So this is the, where the action happens. This is where the inputs are first processed. And what these guys are trying to do is they're trying to reconcile the kind of top-down feedback with sequence learning and with various other context stuff and trying to slow down the fast change in data down here and characterize what it, what it actually means up here. So you can think of, for example, this guy might be processing phonemes and up here this guy would be processing words. So it would, the phonemes would cycle around in layer four and then the representation that you get up here which goes up to the next layer actually converts that into words, right? Okay, in a process called temporal pooling. Okay, but on the other hand, if you said, say this word, okay, this guy would say, well, I can't hear any words, and then there's an output from there that basically it's saying, I'm expecting to hear these phonemes, and it would then send a signal down here through these guys, and that would actually start generating the phonemes, right? So there's a, basically what happens is the information goes around in a loop, and if it can be handled without doing any work, then this thing gets kept out of the loop and only does fine adjustments. But if, the, if there's no input that justifies what this thing is expecting to see, then you might, you might see some action happening down there. You might see some motor behavior happening. Okay, so that's kind of a schematic of that. And this is really kind of the, uh, my major addition to the theory. So this is uh, an example of a dynamical system. So this is a robot um, that it's not programmed to cycle a bike. Basically what it does is it measures whether or not it's falling over and uh, makes adjustments just dynamically. So this crazy Japanese professor has come up with this thing. But basically he's, con he's just telling it to turn left or right, okay, and to stop, that's all, and it puts its feet down. to stop. That's all the programming it has. So it knows to push harder on one side if it wants to turn left or right but it balances all on its own just dynamically, just by very simple differential equations. 
So that's an example of a dynamical system, and it's just impossible to program computers to do it explicitly or analytically, because it's just too many, uh, too many degrees of freedom. So this is an example of, this is kind of the classic hello world example of, uh, of dynamical systems. This is a very simple, uh, I think they show the, uh, the equations here. One second. Yeah. Okay, so this is called the Lorentz attractor, which is uh, uh, kind of the hello world of dynamical systems. And it's just, it's just these three really simple differential equations, right? Okay, so the rate of change is the stuff on the left. And it's just like uh, parameters times y and parameters times x added together, right? Okay, and it gives you this thing where it seems to be going around in a predictable fashion and it suddenly hops over to the other side in some unknown and unpredictable place, right? Okay, and sometimes it goes into the center, sometimes it goes into the outside, and it never crosses itself, right? So it actually fills this space in this fractal surface, a uh, fractal complex of surfaces. So this thing is basically a dynamical system. It's one of the simplest and most well-behaved, and certainly the most well-studied. But it turns out that if you do this, if you take a measurement, and this is just taking the x coordinate, just basically draw a graph of that, okay, and produce a time series of these measurements, or you can also do the y or the z, <coughs> then in a second you'll see that there's this mathematical theorem that says no matter how complex or crazy this thing is, if you just take this time series measurement, right, okay, of one of these variables, any variable at all that's coming, that has a certain relationship with what's going on in here, and then you plot uh, data from the time series. I'll just bring it on a little bit now. One second there. Yeah, we'll go into it now. Okay, so, and you basically plot three successive values depending on how many, uh, d how many uh, parameters it has. The thing you plot, you just basically go the value at time t, the value at time t plus tau, and the value at time t plus 2 tau, and you use those as your x, y, and z. When you plot that, you'll see it now in a second. It looks exactly the same, right? It's not geometrically exactly the same, but it's topologically exactly the same. But it looks exactly the same as the original thing that you're just taking one measurement from, right? And this theorem that was developed in 1981 or something like that called Tacken's theorem. Now, you can see this, right? Okay. So this is just plotting x, t, x, t minus tau, x, t minus 2 tau. You can see it's the same thing, right? It's got two loops. It jumps from one to the other. goes in to some random place. And it's hopping around exactly the same way. As the, as the system it's modeling, right? Okay, and it turns out that for certain types of systems, this is mathematically true. You can see this is just like a twisted version of that, right? Okay, right? But it's just using one variable that's being generated by this, right? Any sequence of measurements, you can make something that is effectively the same thing. The forecasts that you can do about this, okay, are exactly the same as the forecasts you can do about this, right? Okay, so if you predict that something will go up or round or turn left or whatever it is, it'll turn left in your simulator as well as it'll turn left in the, in the real thing, right? Okay? And so it goes on like this for a little minute, right? But anyway, it turns out that uh, for this thing, this theorem only holds for certain mathematical uh, behaviors and smooth functions and all this kind of stuff of, your, of this thing, and the measurement has to be some smooth function of that. That's when it's mathematically true. Turns out you can apply it to practically apply it to practically any kind of dynamical system they can find, like social networks, uh, ant systems, you name it, right? Okay, natural systems of any type, and it just still works, right? So this basically is the the basis for uh, my extension of what the brain is doing, right? Okay, essentially what it's doing is it's making one of these out of something that it's measuring out of reality, okay? And it's doing that in layer four, okay? So basically what it's doing is it's plotting these little, these little line segments in here, and you can basically look at that, and that tells you what's going on here, right? And when the parameters of this change, then the parameters of this change will, will change in the same sort of way. And what layer two and three are doing is they're basically telling you what the parameters are, okay? So... 
And HDM, we're, we're proving that. That's what I have to do. I have to do a mathematical version of this. But basically, we can prove that it can lock on to any particular version of that and identify what the, what the characteristics of this are as they change. And that's basically what all the bits of our brains are doing. That's what they're for. So, for example, I have a dynamical system in my head, which is my thoughts, and I'm generating a sequence of measurements from it, which are my words. And you're getting a time series of these measurements, and you're doing this. I'm, I have this. I'm making words. I'm sending them to you, and you're making ideas that correspond to the ideas that I have. And that's what language is. Okay, and that's why languages can be of different types and structures, as long as they have this kind of relationship with my thoughts, and you can do a similar reconstruction. So, and you can do a whole lot of things like explain dyslexia and a whole lot of other things with that. Okay. Right, so that's the basic theory. And so the brain is a dynamical systems computer. Uh, we have a mathematical model for cortical function, which we're still building. Uh, layer 4 in cortex models real-world dynamics. Layers 2 and 3 characterize the real world. Layer 1 provides top-down context. Layer 5 acts on the world. And layer 6 is the OS of the brain. Um, and that's essentially the stuff. So there was supposed to be a demo, but the software does not build. Um, so uh, that would be me. So these are the various different resources. So numenta.org is where the main community open source uh, kind of repository is. Um, and inbits.com is my blog. And the software which I was going to show you is called Comportex. And that's part of a community-run repo that we have there. Um, so thanks very much. And uh, so any questions? Okay, well, the, the major hypothesis, the kind of central hypothesis of, of HDM is that everything is represented using these sparse distributed rep representations. And we have uh, very good supporting evidence for that. The thing is that it's a, it's a natural science that we're doing, right? So you can't, if you're, like, the, if you build a mathemat mathematical model of it, which I've done, then you can reason about that. So you can say what's true or false mathematically about what the model is, right? Okay. But that doesn't necessarily correspond to what the brain is doing. Okay? Um, but what you can do is like the, the design of the way that the neurons work, the way that the columns work, the way that the, uh, the, all the central algorithms work, um, all of those things are based on hard neuroscience. In other words, there's nothing allowed in there that any neuroscience says can't be there or you know, says it's something else. So for example, there's no backprop, right? So you can't have backprop because you don't have, uh, you don't have bi bidirectional connections in real neocortex, right? Um, but you don't need backprop because all these things basically use local learning rules and local objective functions. So, and they're basically, uh, essentially they're energy saving. Each one of them, like of a, a post that basically goes down through from synapses right up to uh, layers and regions of, of cortex that basically says, what's the energy saving function? What's the stability maintaining? What's the homeostatic drive for each of those things? Um, in terms of human cognition, uh, what we're trying to do is we're trying to replicate what a region of cortex does. And what happens is, is that uh, if you can succeed in doing that, and it does simple things like sensory information, if it does things like natural language processing, which we have, uh, which we have an, a, a series of applications doing, um, then 
once you build this kind of multi-layer model, which nobody else is building at the moment because they're kind of concentrating on just a couple of layers at the moment, um, but me and a couple of other people are going ahead and building this uh, larger scale uh, component. And the idea basically is that we can connect those things together into larger networks and those networks will uh, perform higher level cognitive functions. Right? So that's the, that's the plan. Now we have some evidence that it already works like that, but we have to actually build the entire components and make sure that they work the way we expect them to work and then connect them together and then give them the appropriate data and the appropriate representation. But I'm pretty sure that uh, just by mental modeling of the computational model, that, which is all I can do at the moment before the software is written, um, I'm pretty sure that the kind of cognitive functions that we're used to talking about at a higher level are, this is exactly what you need to do those things. You know, along with uh, things like the hippocampus from memory. You know, so. Any other questions? Sorry, yeah. Yeah, correct, yeah. So, but uh, you said you also showed that um, you have one line going back to the motor, motory, like, uh, at, like from the lowest level you showed, uh, there was something going to the, uh, I think, fifth or fourth layer, and then going back, and you said yeah. that's going to the, so that's, that's not considered back pro uh, propagation, no. because it's not going to another layer. No, back, back propagation is when you have a feed-forward network, okay, and then you have, at the end of the feed-forward network, you have some supervised target, okay, and you compare the output of the network to the target, and then that generates an error, and then what you do is you back-propagate that error by calculating derivatives of all the feed-forward connections and assigning credit, and then updating all the weights all the way back down to the input, okay? That's, how back, that's what backprop means, and that's, that's how all neural networks work, right? Okay, so this just, this, that's impossible in brains because they don't work that way. They only have, and, and also because there's so much noise in real uh, nerve tissue that it's about one bit per bit. So these guys are basically calculating, you know, tiny little gradients of uh, functions that like vary by 0.0001 and updating things based on that. Whereas in real brains, the information loss is approximately one bit per bit, right? Okay, so you, it's like, each synapse fails 90% of the time, right? Okay, so only 10% of signals go through any synapse in real brains, okay? And then you've no idea, like, basically there's no way of predicting where your information came from or how to assign cred credit to it, and there's no physical mechanism for doing that either. So we just forget about that and we come up with mechanisms that learn using just local information about the, uh, the correspondence. It's called uh, spike time dependent plasticity. It's basically when a neuron fires shortly after it gets a signal from here, uh, the voltage change when it fires goes along the membrane to that place and chemicals inside basically say, well, I just got a signal and, I, uh, and the membrane just fired, so I'm going to increase the size of this synapse. And that's what happens. So basically, everything is done very locally um, at the junctions. You know, so, um, yeah, so we don't model anything that normal neural networks, but we can, we can transpose what they're doing into what we're doing. It's just that there's so much more power in each neuron that it doesn't make any sense to try and replicate what they're doing or try and uh, correspond it directly. It's just, it's a whole other, whole other sport. Um, I can possibly just show you, um, this is Felix's stuff now, I'm not sure. So this is Felix basically giving a demo of, uh, this is the guy who wrote Comportex. And this is a closure script visualization system that he's using. And he basically has these, these are the inputs to the, 
to the layering. It's two layers here, and he can go in and visually inspect any one of these columns and neurons. So here you can see here that he's, um, he's basically looking at a neuron that's in here, sorry, a column that's in here, and it has, uh, these are the neurons in the column. And then he can click on one of those things, and he can see what the inputs are, and he can see what the um, predictive inputs are, and so on. And he has all these kind of graphs and readouts and visualizations of how each thing is learning and how each thing is, uh, is responding to the thing. So it's, and it's all done. He, basically, the whole, uh, this whole you know, 100 million uh, synapse thing is actually running in the browser in Clojure Script. And there's another video on this that I'm going to put these things up on GitHub. Um, but there's another uh, guy who's actually just finished school and he's integrated this but using client server stuff so that it's lightweight in the browser. Just gonna see. Yeah, so you can see there that he's inspecting these things here. And you can see these are basically histograms of uh, how, the, how the prediction errors are evolving and all this kind of stuff. So, um, but it's, like, it's completely awesome when you, when you can get it running, but um, and these are showing all the different connections between the different neurons and the different layers. So that's, that's his thing. And then there's this guy who literally just finished school, and he integrated all of that into, uh, into Gorilla REPL, which is just astonishing. But you can see basically he's running this uh, Felix's code, and he's generating things in Gorilla REPL that are basically you know, pulling out information about that. So you can see there... This is the same thing that uh, Felix is doing, but it's running inside a Gorilla REPL. Right? So the code is just like, that's why I wanted to do, you know, spend half the time doing the demo, because you know, this stuff just uh, blows people away. So both of those things are up on YouTube, and I recommend that you go in and take a look at it. Now you'll, you'll now know what the different things mean uh, based on this. But um, you can see that this stuff is like, it's the power of Clojure and the power of Clojure script. That you can do all this stuff. Um, I'm not sure what library, graphics library. I was trying to get him to use uh, Quill to do this because that's what I use, but he's using something else. But like you can see, basically how you can just because all this stuff is just data, you know. All these things are just data structures, and so you can just stop the thing and just click on different things, and it'll just show you all the different stuff. It's all just maps and vectors of ordinary closure data you know, with simple functions. I think um, the software that originally started this thing that Numenta have developed, um, and it's one of the reasons why we decided to start using Clojure is because single Python files for one class out of a whole nested hierarchy and structure of uh, stuff, but the co some of the core classes, several of them, like dozens of them, are more than 3,000 lines long for one class. And uh, Felix's entire code base for all this stuff is less than 3,000 lines of closure. Right, okay. You know, and it runs client server, it runs in the browser. And he, this guy took like a couple of weeks to integrate it with Gorilla Rapid. You know, so it's an astounding piece of work and it's actually the most advanced implementation of HTML anywhere. Oh, sorry, of HTM anywhere. And the other guys are months behind. Uh, what Felix is doing. Okay, so that's in lieu of a demo. Sorry, but uh, I can just show you like moving pictures of something. Right. Um, the last time I was here, I was actually able to demo it, and I was kind of going, "Oh shucks!" Like that just I should have just done that first, or just done that. Right. Okay, because it just explains everything. So, um, okay, that'd be me. Thanks very much. Cheers. Um, thanks very much. So that's it for seeing the next one today and uh, the month. So thank you for coming for another 10 minutes to go here or something like that. Okay. Thanks very much. Cheers. <laughs>